morning, everyone. Good to see so many faces, um, familiar and, and uh, new, and exciting to be here to talk about unlocking space from meanwhile use to community ownership. And um, together with these amazing people and a group of others doing this work around the country to localize and democratize ownership and access to space, we've started to weave a network, a peer network of people doing this. And we call ourselves community asset developers, a different breed, a different form of developer. And we've started to weave a mycelial network, which we'll, we'll share a little bit more about in a minute. Um, but I want to hear a little bit first from some community asset developers and uh, what they're doing in their, in their places. So let's hear some love from Catherine, who, from Artspace Lifespace, who signed up to this an, an hour and a half ago. Um, over to you, Catherine, for your best winging it. Thank you. Yes, I haven't got anything prepared, so I'll just give you a bit of background about Artspace. We are a meanwhile, uh, we call ourselves creative placemakers. We take on meanwhile spaces. We look at different uses for them with the hope that that these spaces will become long-term creative venues. Um, we currently operate five venues in Bristol, including this one. So um, when the doors to this closed in 2017, um, we were talking with people uh, asking, what's the plan for this mansion? Uh, and nobody had a clue. Um, I first came to Bristol in 2008. This was one of the first places I visited. We tried to come inside, and people shoot us away as if we were like you know, the, not, not very welcome. So 10 years later, I was handed the keys and given a mansion to explore and create. And it, it's fantastic because we're able to have events like this. We're able to have young people come into this building and say what they want to see in the future. So Meanwhile gives you these fantastic opportunities to explore these amazing spaces that you may not otherwise be able to get into. And that's how Art Space started. It was created by the Invisible Circus, who just wanted to make shows and have great times in wonderful environments like this. Um, but they soon saw the need to, to operate these buildings for longer term uh, meanwhile uses. And so they set up Art Space Life Space to manage manage the meanwhile spaces that they're in. Now, the name Art Space, Life Space came from people living and working in the spaces. And people often ask us, how is your model so successful? Well, a lot of that is down to opportunity. There were a lot of empty spaces in Bristol at the time. People lived together, worked together in the space. So people were able, were skipping and making communal meals. And we didn't have the, that cost of living crisis that has hit us now. So a lot of the work that was possible then is because people weren't paying rent, that they were all coming together in the one space to make these spaces uh, possible. We became a registered charity in 2016, so there's a lot more pressure on us as an organization. But yet we still want to invest in these wonderful spaces and take risks like we have done. We're taking on Ashton Court Mansion. We initially took it on. We said for two years, we're going to be um, here. By the time our new lease term ends, we'll be here eight years. Uh, but also, this is the house that, as our venue manager, um, Joe Kimber, uh, calls it, the house that nobody wanted. Um, it's been empty for a number of years now um, from people living here. There's still no long-term plan. And often what we see uh, from the buildings that we operate, we're given, we're given the, the dregs of the assets, um, or as the, the council calls them, the liability. So we really want to change that on, on its head. Like It's great to be able to come into these places, to enjoy them, to activate them. It's a great opportunity to have low-cost rent, to try out new things, but then what happens when the community comes to know and love these places of public spaces, and how do we ensure that the communities aren't left behind? And that's where community ownership and, and these conversations Conversations are really important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Juliet again. I'm a community asset developer. Um, I love that term. It's not something that I thought I'd, uh, I'd work to do. Um, and I think most of us in this field are in this space because we're reacting to an immediate need within our communities. Uh, more often than not, it, we're not applying just for a job. We're trying to make change that is sustaining for ourselves and for those around us. And um, personal story. So for me, um, growing up in East London, and apologies, I'm looking down because I want to keep the time. 
Um, growing up in East London as a migrant um, with diverse communities of other marginalised groups, it was a self-organised community and civic infrastructures that built the foundations that sustained our own self-sense of identity and dignity. This idea of community and resilience and growth came from those civic infrastructures that were self-organised. It was a way to kind of build bridges, have a place of sanctuary, cultural outputs, exchange, that really helped with all of our mental health, but also allowed us to all build skills together. And there's a quote by John Powell. He's a, a professor at the Institute of um, Belonging at Berkeley. And he says that when our external environment changes drastically within a short period of time, it can be a violence to our psychological well-being. And I think a lot of communities feel like this when their areas change quickly due to gentrification. And over two decades, at least in East London, and specifically in Hackney Wick, where I was living for a very long time, we saw assets and spaces disappear. Almost you blink and they're gone. So these civic infrastructures that were there to sustain us and help us build bridges and help us get to know each other in our diverseness were going. And therefore, as individuals and as communities, we feel that in our bodies. So as part of Stour and collectives of people around Stour, we decided to kind of take action. And part of that was really taking on those buildings that were still left. So, yeah, there were empty spaces in Hackneywick. They were cheap at that time. We saw property prices just move up astronomically. And so we took a risk, as you'd see in economic terms, taking a risk. We didn't have the funding for it, but we signed that lease and self-built. So 15,000 square foot of space, and we delivered what the community wanted. There wasn't necessarily a theory of change. There wasn't a business plan. It was us coming together to go, let's do something. Let's take some action. And so it became 40 studios, a gallery space, place for dance, culture, space to be together. And it was fun. That's the other part of it. It was just so exciting to sort of have a sense of ownership, but also have a sense of power. The power to kind of resist the, regen the regeneration that was coming across at pace, but also to understand how the system works. We created a cross-subsidy model where we would rent out the space for amazing weddings and then keep everything affordable or cheap or free. And that was really part of the ethos, that we didn't, never wanted to be playing with the market. We wanted to ensure that everyone felt that they belonged and everyone felt that the space was for them. So we started off as a meanwhile space. We took a lease for three years and then another three years and then another three years. So it was great to always renegotiate the extra three years, but as actors, as, as, as leaders within that community, we felt there was this almost looming inevitability that this, these buildings that we were leasing would, would be redeveloped. So after nine years, we kind of talked to the landlord and said, you know, is there an opportunity to buy this? We would like to have stewardship and ownership over these assets. And they said, yeah go ahead, this is the price, half a million. If you can raise it, you can have it. But then we went through another stage of trying to understand you know, who would invest in us, how long will it take? Within 18 months, when we finally found an impact investor, the price had gone up to 1.2 million. So therefore, the process of transitioning from meanwhile to ownership and stewardship you know, is not as simple as it seems. Um, we registered that first asset as an asset of community value. So it was one of the first in London, actually, um, to be registered in, using the Localism Act. But we never managed to acquire that particular asset. And that was frustrating after 12 years within the community. So we decided to take another step and find a developer who understood the value of community and the value of, of creativity. And after six years of negotiation and sort of showcasing what's possible and reimagining with us, uh, we came to an agreement of uh, an asset that would be sustained for the community and stewarded for the community um, at Peppercorn for a thousand years. And Stour Trust is modeling that and, and scaling that across London. And for us as an organization, it's really about keeping our ethos and keeping our values, um, eradicating um, and democratizing, sorry, access to land um, and increasing racial and, and, and economic equality. What we found as a challenge, and there are many challenges in our story, is trying to keep your authenticity, meaning that you know, how, do you, how do you communicate the value of creativity and community and joy and love when you need to sustain yourself and when you need to impress funders? 
and we may, we managed to as 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 our model to ensure that we would not negotiate a lease that was less than 25 years because sustaining that foothold in the community is really vital. Some of the challenges that we had were the fact that when you are a community of colour, it's quite difficult to navigate all the various systems to be able to showcase your credibility, to be able to shape shift and translate languages between your community to the local actors, to the policy holders. But we hold that space collectively really, really well. And now we've come to a point where, with the Community Asset Developer Network that we're developing, we're hoping to acquire more assets across London, but also build expertise to help and support others. So that's really our story. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's why I'm here, just to hear the stories, really. So uh, it's absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for hosting us, Catherine and Stir. This is um, just a wonderful excuse to talk a little bit about the various journeys within the ecosystem that, that Bex men mentioned, and also to kind of um, expose it, warts and all, some of the fantastic opportunities that have been mentioned around Meanwhile, but also some of the major shortcomings, and just have to sort of pause and reflect on the thousand-year leases that you're now negotiating on and just how absolutely inspiring and incredible that is. Um, Make Space's story, we're, we're a relatively young organisation, so we set up about six years ago by a group of architects, artists, makers and non-profits who, similar to the other stories, were being priced out of, of our city, Oxford, and struggling to, struggling to access any kind of uh, buildings in which to operate, let alone kind of collaborate and, and co-locate. Um, we've, we're now developing a narrative around spatial justice as our kind of North Star guiding light, and we'll unpack a little bit about what that means, hopefully. But essentially, we believe everyone has the right to safe, secure, and affordable and beautiful spaces in which to live, work, and develop a sense of belonging. And we're working with an, an amazing set of partners locally and nationally to, to try and um, unfold that vision. Um, we, as with all organisations, started where we could, so a two-year meanwhile lease on a vacant college building. And just to, to, to situate ourselves, I'm sure all of you know Oxford or have an idea of Oxford. It's you know, synonymous with great wealth and prestige, but it's also one of the least affordable cities in the UK and one of the most unequal, and that's the same for the wider county. And that really means that you get these extreme pockets of, of deprivation, neglect, underinvestment, um, and extreme poverty um, alongside eye-watering wealth. And that's something that we're trying to, to tackle head on. Um, we've been doing that. We've, been, we've had the opportunity to, to develop and adapt a model that is really about trying to bring lots of different brilliant organisations together. Similarly, on a sort of uh, tiered rental model, what we call a, a fairer or affordable rent that's based on an organisation's turnover and what they can afford rather than what the market suggests. And we've had the tremendous opportunity of some grant investment uh, as part of a COVID recovery fund to develop uh, a program called Meanwhile in Oxfordshire that allowed us to expand the model countywide. And we did that in a very short pace, uh, period of time, just 18 months, coming through the back end of the pandemic. We were tasked with um, spending one point, or investing £1.7 million to unlock vacant buildings right the way across the county. Um, and that was through the Getting Building Fund. And we worked with a tremendous range of partners. And it was led by the local authority. The local authority really drove that. Money came through the local enterprise partnership. And what we were able to do with a terrific group of partners was unlock 28 buildings. It's about 35,000 square feet of space. And in the last couple of years, we, um, we've supported over 100 organisations supporting uh, more than 200 or creating more than 200 jobs with a big priority on all of them being living wage and a uh, focus on um, purpose-driven startups as well. And so we, we've had this incredible benefit of really seeing um, what happens when you put two problems together, this um, burgeoning uh, number of vacant spaces because of the underinvestment, because of the cuts, uh, alongside the desperate need for space from an incredible uh, group of social and environmental justice-based organisations. And now we're 
doing a bit of soul searching and in what I'd call a sort of refounding process to move from, meanwhile, all of the leases that we brokered were on a, a sort of 12 months to 10 year basis, um, which, and we were pretty proud when we were getting to 10 years, but in the shadow of a thousand years, um, it's put, it's, puts it in context. And so how do we gear shift our thinking to, yes, start where you can, start with a meanwhile lease. Um, the, the possibility in, in those kind of liminal and temporary spaces is incredible. It generates fantastic energy, but how do you avoid becoming just another agent of gentrification and hyperinflation of asset prices? So how do we move from that to um, what some people in our space are calling kind of seven generation city thinking, where we can be genuinely good ancestors? So towards community ownership, for sure, and beyond to self-ownership and starting to think about how, how our assets, how our more than human kin, how our living systems, how our, how our trees and our rivers and the infrastructure around us can be self-owned and generate or be recognized for the inherent value that it has and not just how we commodify it and financialize it. And so that's really, I suppose, the, the first step on, on the next chapter of our journey. Um, and we're really um, privileged to be able to do that amongst uh, an ecosystem of actors that, that Bex and others are convening. And um, be very happy to talk a bit more in terms of the nuts and bolts of how we unlock those spaces and all the pitfalls and challenges if we want to get into the tactics, because I know we're preaching to the converted here. Let's give them all some serious love, guys. As you can hear, it's, it's long-term work and there's loads of joy and energy and relationships, but there's also some personal struggle, right? The struggle is real. So, yeah, just really acknowledging that. Um, I, I'll mention a little bit more about the, the mycelial network that, that Platform Places, together with a, a whole group of others, are co-weaving. And other partners that are convening include Footwork Trust, Power to Change, some, some community asset developers like Melissa Mean from We Can Make in Bristol, and Jess Steele from Hastings Commons, Jess Prendergast from uh, Onion Collective, a whole network of people around the country. And I think the, the realization from this group is that the, there is power in our collective, that the, the strength is in collectivizing. So between just 10 community asset developers, they, they own over 70,000 square meters of, uh, of assets for long-term community use. That's 25 million pounds in fixed assets. They've enabled over 2,000 community organizations to access affordable space long-term. And they've leveraged over 175 million for community-led regeneration. So alone, individually, the struggle is real and the grapple with, with funders, with landlords, with the big powerful institutions. But, but as a collective, there is much more ability to negotiate, to bring funders to the, t to the, to the table, to co-design new funding instruments, to bring pension funds in and say, what does it look like to create a massive community buyout fund, um, long-term patient repayable capital for, for the assets we need. So that's some of the work we're doing now. And uh, in terms of that, that first bit of funding, it's redesigning the grant, grant ecosystem so that we can have salaries rather than sacrifice uh, for, these, for these people doing this work. Um, we've raised the first two and a half million pounds for this, and the next step in the work is to raise two and a half billion. So we're being ambitious, and, um, and that's, what, that's what we think we, the scale of change that we need to, to really start shifting ownership towards one third um, of, our, of our towns and neighborhoods. So, so that's some of the mycelial work, and I'm, I'm aware that like, what we've heard from the panel is start where you are, start with the two year lease. Start with the, the collective of people who care in your place because that's a, a foothold, that's a way in, it's a first step on a pathway to this longer term work. It builds confidence, it builds connections and credibility. Um, but I think given who's here and, and the, the number of people interested in, in getting started on this journey, it would be interesting to dig into the tactics a bit more. So yeah, how, how do you go from, from nothing, from scratch to we have a two year lease, we are, we're running a building. Um, anyone who wants to, to jump in? First of all, just say, if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, a, a lot of people will just look at buildings and go, oh, I'd love to get that, but I don't know how. Um, and being able to find those connections, it, like you can go down the land registry route 
find out who owns the building. Um, but often you need that introduction that way in. Um, it took art space putting on mad mental shows through the Invisible Circus to reach the notice of the council who then said, yeah, you do need your own space. And now we are trusted as an organisation. We're pr- we're, we've been proven to be able to activate spaces safely, well, affordably. Um, but if you're starting out and you're trying to find your own space, um, partnerships are key. So we partner uh, on a project uh, called Sparks Bristol. We're working with an amazing sustainability organisation called Global Gold Centre and they didn't know buildings and they didn't know how to really get into the space so if you're not sure, partner, there's other people out there running buildings as Beck said, we're, we're much stronger together and collectively you can achieve your aims Well, how do you start? I think it's intuition and again just stepping into what you want to do and having that boldness Um, sometimes you don't have a choice, you just need to do it. Um, For us, that was the case. And and we were very fortunate that at that time there were many warehouses that had been abandoned. The the first one we got had been empty for 20 years. So actually the landlord was pleased to have a conversation with us. So, um, and also pleased that he wouldn't have to do any builds. So we said, we'll just take it and we'll figure it out. And, um, And that was sort of the step. And not realising at the time what the road roadmap was, but actually the first post that we put out was saying, if you have skills, if you have time, come help us build. And there was a queue outside because people were really interested to come and, you know, humans are not sort of curious. What's going on here? You know, this is what I want. So we actually collected quite a lot of data about what the community wanted, what they lacked. You know, the, the Hackneywick and Fish Island at that time had one of the highest concentration of artists. Many were moving abroad. So this was an opportunity for them to kind of get, back, you know, a foothold into a space, but also a space that was not governed by strict rules and structures, but a place that could help shape. Um, and then for us, the credibility with the local authority was that you know we were the first public-facing building uh, in Hackmook and Fish Island. Most of the buildings and warehouses at that time were very closed. So we were able to then open that up. People could, you know, the, there was a footfall, we could give information. We became the, you know, the stopping spot for boaters. So we became, you know, we had a relationship with Canal and River Trust. Um, and from then on, you know, the local authority said actually we would like data about who actually lives in Hackmook and Fish Island. And because we knew the community, we could actually knock on doors and do that mapping work for them. So it was really sort of building that relationship that was sort of the first step. Um, if I'm honest, we didn't have, we didn't realise what would come next. We were just sort of in the moment of let's just serve our community and let's start. And then we sort of figured it out. And I think part of doing this work is not necessarily being an expert, an expert at that moment, but actually building, it's like an apprenticeship. You're building every single month, you know, um, and also challenging because we you ask questions, you know, why are contracts only three years? And why is it that a local authority doesn't know the data and why? So therefore, because it, it's your community, you want to help shape that and therefore you become a key partner. So that was sort of for us how it started. Yes, yes, and more. Yeah, yeah, all of that. Um, 100% on the learn by doing and um, and bringing together a community of actors that have a passion. So I think Make Space was built out of a group of activists of different kinds, whether it was um, architects and makers who've been setting up workers' cooperatives to people interested in democratising land and buildings who are setting up housing co-ops to those that were actively involved in squatting movements to really think about how you just get doing and roll your sleeves up and then being willing to listen and look and be open to opportunity. There's so much around that mix, that alchemy of a ton of luck. You need to be ready, but there's a ton of luck involved. And you only do that by having eyes and ears wide open and being really willing to speak to people that might not feel like they're on your side, but you might be able to find an inroad um, and you might be able to find a meeting of minds. Um, landlords are uh, an interesting bunch, but there is a human side to everyone. And so, you know, there's a, there is a way to find mutual um, benefit through negotiations and be open to, to conversations, essentially. Um, I th- but the big ones are really around um, pa- patience. It took us at least 
uh, two and a half, maybe three years to find the first space. So I think being realistic about the time and the trajectory. And even through Meanwhile in Oxfordshire, we said, oh, well, we'll be able to no negotiate that lease and secure it within three months, maybe six. Twelve months later, you're just starting to get to a, a meaningful position. So I think being really realistic on how long things take and that recognition of um, the, the, the movement and the work is it, it runs on its own uh, own time frame and its own trajectory and you just have to be ready for the opportunities as and when they come it's not that everything neatly coincides together so a lot of patience a lot of um, perseverance but being always really really propositional get people excited about the potential of a space the ideas that um, could come through um, I love what some of the organizations in the ecosystem are talking about particularly groups like Civic Square or Healing Justice London where they say we're building social infrastructures we're building physical infrastructures we're also building imagination infrastructures and I think that imagination gap is one of the biggest challenges that we have to overcome and that's the beauty of meanwhile is you can be much as you say Catherine you can take a lot more risks but then you have to gear shift and be a different form and have a different set of infrastructures within your team to then move to a thousand year lease so also recognising that there's an evolution uh, and change that needs to happen in the form of either an organisation or partnerships. Brilliant. Thanks, folks. And last question from me before we open up to the audience. Um, I'm interested in that, in that gear shift, in that pivot to from meanwhile to long-term, longer-term community ownership and wondering what mindsets, capacities, tactics you have, you go through as organizations, as individuals to, to make that happen. You've talked about refounding processes, Andy and Juliet. You talked about the six-year wait. And Catherine, you were saying earlier about some of the challenges of actually why not long-term ownership sometimes. But yeah, if there's any more richness there to go into, invitation to share. Yeah, I can, I can just mention about the challenge of long term. Sometimes a building isn't necessarily um, what is needed. Like this, this building needs 40 to 60 million pounds investment. Um, as a, as a mean, we're a meanwhile space operator, but we're actively looking for our own long term building. I kind of feel that somebody would say, in the same way that they went, yeah, here, have the keys, that they might go, yeah, please take on this 40 to 60 million pound restoration. But is this actually what the city needs, like for us to stop doing the activation around community spaces to become a building preservation charity? Where, where is the value in that? Would another organization be best place? Just because you are given the opportunity of a space, it mightn't be the rest, best space for you and your community. So it's, it's really important not just to grab this long-term opportunity just because you might be handed on it, but actually consider, well, what is it that my community within the, within the area needs? I think for us, probably two things I can pick out from that. One is, you know, starting out, we were individuals who had a passion and then comes the formalization, sort of governance structures, and that kind of creates a dynamic. And I don't, and I would say that we're still, we're really keen to innovate the governance structures of organizations to really ensure that they are democratic, to ensure that, you know, it sort of serves the purpose of what we want to achieve. Um, we grappled with, you know, do we become a limited company, a CIC, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for, you know, accountability? Because, you know, if you're going to apply for funding, there's a certain type of accountability that's needed, but also how you work on the ground is very collective and very, you know, um, yeah, um, democratic. So, yeah, the tensions there. And, I've, and I've, the other thing I think the, the next gear shift is when you come from a very grassroots sort of self-organized space where you have the freedom to deliver what you actually want to deliver. You know, if you feel like, you know, actually we want to ensure that our foyer is a place for dance and freedom and we want to ensure that, you know, we keep our studios as affordable as possible, if not free, then there's a tension with that if you want to scale and let's say you do need investment because your rent is now so high and there are different expectations sometimes then from particular funders who might say, actually, why don't you maximise the space um, to create more income and more profit? And if that isn't your value system, there can be a tension there. And I think for us, we did say no to, to a lot of potential investors because we said this is not going to serve us in the long term because then we're going to strip the community of what of, of you know what they need from this building and that's going to change our own value system which is really ingrained in what we want to do so 
that is a dance. Um, I think things have moved on really positively since then, sort of a decade ago. Um, but we felt at that time that what we were doing felt strange to a lot of other people in the ecosystem. Why art? Why, why do you want to do all this arty stuff? You know? But actually for us, it's like, that's foundational. That's what keeps diverse communities alive and breathing and sane and you know, thriving. And then comes the economic and then comes, you know, then you can build, then you can grow, then you can grow. You know, we, within our building, I think over the period, we supported about 300 small businesses that came through us. And some are now incredibly large breweries, for example, but they nested within our space and that's where they got the creativity. So I think, yeah, so that's maybe for me the, the tension of who you are as an, an organisation. Yeah. Or as a collective, maybe not even an organisation. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Um, I, I think building on that so um it, i mentioned the mindset shift and i think that's probably the biggest one is this idea of um situating yourself over a multi-generational period and um it's just a, you, you're just a collection of people taking a, a group of uh, actions um but it's in a it's in a wider narrative so we're doing a lot of looking back and you mentioned about you know what if a third of uh, our land and buildings were community owned and interesting that's pretty much where the commons were about four uh, to, to 800 years ago you know it was about a third of the land was held in common so how can we get back to where we were mm -hmm. and what was the relationship that we had then so I think there's also there's a mindset shift but there's a relationship relationship shift there you go. There's a nice old, there's a nice old word salad. Um, uh, thankfully, it. I think Danny said it earlier from Stokes Croft Community Land Trust. In that, you know, essentially, it's it's we're in the relationship building industry, and it just so happens that we need spaces and physical infrastructures to um, facilitate that. So, um, those those are certain elements. Um, the governance is absolutely critical, and like what is under the bonnet, and that's the brilliance of um, events like this is you can have um, big picture thinking, but you can also get into the weeds about how to to run a, uh, a community ownership um, fund uh, model or um, community investment fund and, uh, and and similarly when you start you want to be nimble and experimental and for us that was a community interest company because the governance is quite lightweight but in getting into the longer term and thinking about how to be more accountable to our community and not just uh, a collection of individuals um, from one place but actually representation from any place in which you might be uh, looking to support, um, then looking at things like community benefit societies, which is is what we've just refounded as, um, and looking at how you can adopt uh, articles of association that borrow from things like the land trust movement, and so our articles are very much in the spirit of uh, a community land trust, and uh, and so and how does that governance be held very lightly so that you recognise that you need to find ways of uh, of collaborating uh, so that it isn't all about the uh, organizations at hand but it's it's much more about the people and the place and so then experimenting with different forms of uh, of partnership and I think it was it was mentioned earlier you know thinking about public and commons partnerships as a potential um, so I think yeah imagination certainly um, but governance also really key yeah, absolutely. And Jess Steele from Hastings Commons, who I imagine many of you know, talks about the need to hack the system and, and how they've set up four different organisations as part of Hastings Commons to do different bits. The land trust to, hot, to do the long-term stewardship, the development company to be nimble and take risks, an operating management company to do the day-to-day -day operations of um, living rents accommodation. So, uh, yeah... The governance hacks becomes really interesting, uh, and I think I saw Dave Boyle here earlier as well, um, who's like my go-to on all of that. Um, so I want to open up to questions from the audience. What what's sparked your curiosity? What do you want to hear more about? Over to you. Hi, I'm Doug from Adventure Froom. Um, I'm. It's, it's always the social enterprises that the innovators and doing the, the risks and, and pushing things out there. With the death of the high street and the, and the new focus on kind of experiential-led high streets, I'm wondering what is happening at the other end of the telescope that doesn't require the push from us but is a pull from developers and councils to invite us in to create spaces because we create the value, we uh, deliver these third, third spaces that are so valuable for community. Um, and is there stuff happening that doesn't involve us fighting quite so hard to get these spaces, but invitations for us to, to take part in redevelopment? 
Thanks, Doug. Great question. Um, just, to, just in terms of Bristol, to jump in there, there's a group of people in Bristol starting a vacant property task force. Something we're hoping to look at is create like, a, like almost a, a matching dating services between people who are interested in taking on meanwhile space and landlords who would be prepared to take or to give out their buildings as meanwhile spaces. One of, one of the big problems is we're seeing a lot of building owners um, engage in this uh, soul stripping of their buildings or constructive vandalism. So they completely rip out the lighting, the ceilings, so that they can uh, save themselves money on business rates by saying that they're not occupied. But actually, a lot of landlords don't really want to do that. They're not really aware of the, the options. So if they knew that actually there might be a community group that would come into their space, activate it, make it secure or safe, then there might be more opportunities for these spaces to be used on the high street. But it's currently all being done by volunteers. So Art Space are volunteering, members of the Bristol Bid team are volunteering. There's no funding for this piece of work at the moment. And there are a lot of policies in place that make it difficult for people to take on these meanwhile spaces. But the interest is there, and the property agents are starting to be more aware of this. So um, yeah, watch this space in Bristol. Anything else you guys want to jump in with? Um, no, just saying that um, um, so I'm from Somerset myself, Doug, so uh, and I know your area very well. And um, I think that there are some changes happening, some, some mixed, some good, and some seriously questionable. Um, in Oxford, we've had the opportunity of taking on a 40-year lease on a new build space, um, which is really exciting, where civic infrastructure is being considered as part of a new development. There are we would all have mixed views on the wider part of that redevelopment and that's where you have to sort of take very difficult decisions sometimes and it also involves demolition which is not something that is in the spirit of, of why we've set up um, but it's a step in the right direction and I think on a more local level but probably more exciting um, so on East Oxford Cowley Road which is a hyperinflated really expensive um, uh, but multicultural road in East Oxford um, we've seen a Costa Coffee fail and thinking if Costa Coffee can't survive God who can in this place but what's taken it over is the NHS who've set up a, a mental health uh, outpost unit as part of their kind of keystone initiative and within that they are supporting Oxford Community Action who are an amazing uh, mutual support group who are running a community cafe in that space so kind of a bit of a glimpse of hope of like propositional thinking coming from both a big big anchor institution and a local grassroots uh, organisation. So you've got to catch those, um, th those examples where, where they exist and um, I think that sort of puts a shining light on what's possible. I'll just, I'll just quickly mention um, some of the work Platform Places is doing with institutional owners and investors like Legal and General and Schroeder's. Um, and some owners like Elandi and Morgoth. They've been, I guess, on a, le a learning journey with us for three years and are, are actually saying, we used to rent our shops to Topshop, but we can't do that anymore. So where are these amazing community entrepreneurs you're talking about? And exactly that. We're starting now to do that bridging locally, as Catherine's talking about, between owners who have empty units and want to see creative cultural community uses and in, in Wandsworth Town Legal and General are funding that bridging work and funding the salaries of people doing that on the ground connecting and, and movement building locally so it's very small pockets still of the, the biggest owners actually are unlikely allies in this they have um, a lot of ESG uh, goals to meet Hi uh, my name is Tatiana I'm um, a doing a PhD at Swansea Uni and work with an organization that has a pop-up um, project with Swansea Council uh, to do pop-ups in essentially making meanwhile spaces um, a pretty short-term perspective, I would say. Uh, I guess my question kind of goes a bit to this like destruction you're talking about because working behind the scenes and seeing how they've been operating meanwhile spaces. We just did a pop-up in one of the old music stores in Swansea and um, yeah, essentially, um, I think as the, the Swansea Council had bought it, um, and then but prior the uh, landlords weren't paying the rent, and SEC came and like took de-energized uh, the unit, and it's been I guess my question kind of 
I guess, based on utilities, and there's so much, I guess, um, yeah, um, I don't know how to conceptualize this right now, but just with utilities and meanwhile spaces, have, yeah, what are your guys' experiences on this, and are there possible policies that maybe um, different councils have been taking about this, because we have been seeing a lot of, yeah, the, the units are getting, you know, the, the energy units are getting de destroyed and taken out, and to put that back in is, is quite challenging to figure out who to talk to, what to do. So, yeah, any experiences on this? Um, well, just I'm going to speak on behalf of the, the circus. Like, for example, we took on a space recently and a lot was stripped out. We're lucky that the landlord actually put a lot of it back in for us. So, like, we were given a building that had one toilet and didn't have running water. So that was a joy. And uh, we, we, we had taken on this lease not knowing that we, when we went to see it, it was, it was working. Um, and uh, one solution we were looking at was treating it like a festival site, so bringing in generator power, port to lose I'm glad we didn't have to go down that route, but if, when you are taking on particularly these big empty spaces, at the moment you can pretty much um, envision that they are going to be stripped out, but you also have to remember there's no point in you investing heaps of money in a space that in, in, in 12 months could be taken from you, so you have to treat it like a pop-up, like a festival site, um, but also equally there's certainly statutory requirements that you need to meet, so it's really difficult, you have to be a health and safety expert, a legal expert, um, everything. It's, it's quite challenging taking on meanwhile spaces. Um, and this is where uh, you can also look to people like w we brought in um, Arab Hydroc, local companies that were able to give us some pro bono advice and support. So there are, um, as we said, there's a lot of people that have these um, environmental and social value targets that they need to meet, and they'll be happy to give you advice. Bring them in, use those people. Yeah, I mean, for us, we wouldn't take on anything now that's less than two years because even the smallest amount of investment, it feels like a sunk cost, um, both on an environmental basis and on a, on a financial basis. Um, but yes, similarly, there are so many um, spaces in buildings and, and unit types that are inaccessible uh, for meanwhile or anything beyond medium long term. I was cycling through the city to get here and thinking, oh, if only Oxford had warehouses like, uh, like you um, experience everywhere in Bristol. And of course we do. We have a whole island of warehouses owned by the university, but they've stripped them out and deinvested in them over such a sustained period that you don't, they're just completely unsafe. Um, but the potential there is enormous. So yeah, I suppose just empathizing with your frustration and the recognition that sometimes you know, a space is not the right space or you need a certain time frame or you need a certain group of backers behind you to make it worth everyone's while because it's so much energy. I'll just make a comment. It's less to do with our meanwhile space, but I think this might be useful for people getting um, negotiating asset with a developer. Um, one thing that we experienced, and just to reiterate, it took us six years from the beginning of our negotiation to actually getting an agreement for lease. And part of that was that, you know, within at least I speak for London, is that we had negotiated something called Shell and Core. And there isn't actually a definition for what Shell and Core is. So whilst we went through the negotiation process and having conversations with our um, developer, you know, it was sort of agreed that we would have certain things like, you know, we'd have a lift, we'll have windows, we'll have, you know, basic Shell and Core, you know, flooring. Um, but when we actually saw the draft that came back from um, planning was that, you know, how the developer interpreted that was that they'll just give us a lift shaft. And that there have been um, there have been examples of shell and core, meaning that actually there are no windows, and they could have um, potentially got away with actually giving us no windows. So part of a lot of our work for about 18 months was actually working with our local authority and the GLA and coordinating with various boroughs across London to find out which borough had interpreted shell and core to the advantage of us as a community and then getting the GLA to work with us to standardise that and then hopefully put that within the London plan so that local authorities will take that as a standard, as a, a reference point. And that work is still going on. So that's something we kind of 
when we talk about the doing the work, is that what we want to do is not just do it for ourselves, but for others. So therefore, you get into that space where we're actually doing that work of negotiating and interpreting and also helping others along the line who are in that space to kind of get the best deal they can. And, and there are many nuances like that. So, so yeah, so I think there, is, there are always this sort of interpretations of policy um, or, or guidance that can be leveraged for yourself. But you have to... We wouldn't have known that if we hadn't had a good relationship with the GLA and the local authority who sent us this draft plan. It's also quite often that if you do do a negoti negotiation with the developer, because as a community organisation, you're not party to the development, you might wait until the decision notice is given and then there's no room for negotiation. So really, it's really important to make sure that you're part of the process at every point and really digging, basically hounding with your local authority to get access to all documents as they're drafted to make sure you can influence that. So that's, yeah, that's the piece of work. But what we're hoping for that, you know, in five years it will be standardised, but still work to do. And it's just bonkers that in, <laughs> in commercial property, isn't it? That it's not standard that you get walls, windows, a roof and basics to function. Like, can you imagine if someone tried to rent you a house and they were like, oh yeah, you need to put your own windows in. Like, you need to do your own roof. Like that. Yeah. Or even just, yeah, uh, 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 an electricity point or a yeah, utilities yeah. point that can cost, you know, tens of thousands of pounds. Yeah. Uh, but then you don't have to do it. But you can, yeah. But ideally, what we're trying to get to at the moment is that actually every negotiation within Section 106 will be something called um, Cat A. So you don't have to worry about shell and core. You get all the basics in. So that's something that, yeah. Go, Juliet. Go, Star Trust. I think we've got time for one more question and some punchy answers. So there's a hand up just there. In the middle. Hi there, Danny from Coexist. It's um, actually not a question, just something to do with meanwhile, from meanwhile to um, community ownership. There's a tool that we're developing at the moment called If and When, and it's an agreement with landlords um, that you can uh, have first refusal for purchase of that building, and it's getting a valuation of the property at the beginning by an independent and mutually agreed um, assessor, and then one at the point of sale and splitting the difference. So that it's with benevolent landlords actually seeing that actually that community organisation has contributed a lot of value to being there in the upkeep of the building, and so they share that kind of increase in, in value. Um, and so that's a tool that we're kind of currently developing and perhaps a mode of thinking that we'd like to encourage others to kind of take on as well. Thanks very much. That tool is called If and When um, Coexist, Bristol. Thank you. Um, any, any tools or... Uh, like toolkits you want to signpost briefly just to just to close um it's not there yet but we are developing an mt property toolkit we had one years ago so if anybody is interested in taking on their own meanwhile property it covers how to get it legals etc and we're we're just waiting on a few other people to contribute um but hopefully by next year at the latest it'll be ready so um we'll send out information about how you can sign up to that no toolkits at the moment, but what we're, try what we're aiming to uh, produce over the next 12 months is a series of templates for community asset developers who are negotiating. I mean, we had never seen a head of terms or a standard head of terms, so we borrowed it from others. Um, there are various legal documents, that agreement for lease. So you know, basically being able to kind of download an example uh, of what of the various documents you will have along the pathway so that you know what you'll be dealing with, so that we want to just basically share that with the community. Um, so hopefully in about 12 months we'll have that um, for everybody to have. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Yeah, no, we're, we're very happy to share any of the kind of... We haven't got any templates that are sort of easily downloadable online because they're somewhat bespoke. We're very happy to share any of the example heads of terms and leases and licenses that we've had the benefit of developing with the support of others. Meanwhile, Space CIC have been doing this for a long time, obviously, and I'm sure are well known here, and they do have uh, more toolkits available to download online. And I think also just that shout-out again for those working on the yeah. imagination infrastructure space, um, Civic Square at have been mentioned um, because I think yeah they're also offering up uh, a really terrific model of how we change the frame and change the narrative which I think is also an important part of persuading landlords to shift from temporary to uh, handing over the keys and the assets long term. That's a beautiful note to end on thanks let's give a massive massive round of applause to our panel. <laughs> <laughs>